In 2004, the Fate Stay Night visual novel hit, and ever since, it's kinda still been hitting. And it seems to only be growing every year. Adaptation after adaptation. You got some mobile games, some mango, visual novel spin-offs. Hell, there's even a Fate Khalid OVA. The Fate series is massive in length, but there is often one route which I feel is often just overlooked. That one route is, of course, the Fate route. And in today's video, I want to take a more comprehensive look at the story of the visual novel version of the Fate route and then compare them to the subsequent versions of Fate route, including the 2006 Studio Dean adaptation, the interesting story behind the manga release, and of course, the possibilities of a remake and what I would like to see from it. This is possibly the biggest video I've ever created, and I made sure to make this video as in-depth as I possibly could. So if you could could simply just like the video at any point while watching. This uh, this took a while to make. Multiple months. Lots of hours. So, with that being said, let's go in depth on Fate Stay Night's The Fate Route. Commonly referred to as Fate Route, Fate Stay Night is the first route in the trilogy of routes for the Fate Stay Night visual novel. Featuring a very strong romance arc between our main character Shiro Emiya and his servant Saber, as well, the series takes a much more shonen esque presentation. This leads to characters like Shiro Emiya adopting rather annoying character traits of the time, like him not believing girls can fight, and that they're precious creatures, so you, you get weird scenes where Shiro is jumping in front of Berserker's attacks and practically being sliced in half. To say the least, Fate Route, more than its alternate storylines, is probably the one to take the most watered-down approach that was more in line with its contemporaries of the time. That being said, there is one hell of a story packed into Fate Route that I think most people are simply overlooking or not appreciating enough. But to get there, we're going to have to go on a little bit of a journey. Where else to begin than from the beginning? Shiro wakes up in a hospital and is adopted by the Magus Karitsugu Emiya. And as this video goes along, I'm sure I'll mispronounce things, but that's okay. You can tell me in the comments below if I've mispronounced anything. Shiro was one of the only survivors of the Great Fire in Fuyuki City, which was started by the previous Holy Grail War. From there on, Shiro is raised as Karitsugu's child, and since he is a Magus, Karitsugu teaches Shiro a basic strengthening skill and as well, meditation. But eventually, Karitsugu passes away and Shiro is washed over by Fujimura Taiga, or Fujine, who also just happens to be one of Shiro's teachers. But after witnessing a fight between Lancer and Archer, Shiro is hunted down by Lancer and killed. He is then brought back to life by Rin Tosaka, but is attacked again later that night at his home. But due to Shiro's training, he is able to survive Lancer's attack just enough to summon his servant. Saber. Considered to be one of the strongest classes, Saber is an extremely powerful servant and after even being wounded by Lancer's gay bulg, is still able to pursue him. But when pursuing them, Saber inadvertently runs into Archer and slashes him across the chest. And it turns out that Rin Tosaka is the master of Archer, a servant who wasn't perfectly summoned and thus can't remember much about who he is. The Fate Route, like every other route, has the same beginning and prologue that every other Fate does. But what makes it so unique is what happens afterward. Shiro is taken to the church, where Kirei Kodamine resides as the moderator of the war, and explains what happened in Fuyuki ten years prior. Shiro accepts his role in the Grail War as the seventh master to help stop a catastrophe like the one that happened ten years ago. This is an important motivation for Shiro Emiya, and it comes up often in this route. Shiro simply wants everyone to get out of this as unscathed as humanly possible and in turn become the hero he's always wanted to be just like his father. Shiro's ideal of being a hero is something that is a massive thing for his character in all of the routes, but is likely the most prominent in Fate Route as later on it ties directly into his relationship with characters like Saber. But at this point in the story, think of Shiro as this pure-hearted person with only the best intentions. But upon leaving the church, there are no battles allowed on church grounds, the master of Berserker, Elias Viel von Einsburn, attacks Shiro and Rin, leading to a battle with Berserker and Saber. It's revealed before the battle that Berserker's true identity is that of Heracles, but Saber is no match for Berserker's sheer overwhelming power, and since she was summoned as an incomplete servant thanks to Shiro's basic ability 
abilities as a Magus, she is still injured. As Berserker goes in for the final blow, Shiro jumps in the way and sacrifices himself to save Saber. This leaves Ilya confused, and so they leave. Now, this is one of the most hated scenes in all of Fate Route for one reason alone, and that's Shiro jumping in front of Berserker's attacks. To me, it's not a big deal, as at this point, Shiro's personality supports his actions here. Shiro is a hero of justice, or at least he wants to be, and it isn't something totally out of the question. As well, if Berserker landed that blow, then Saber would absolutely be dead, and Shiro's role in the war would be done for. I understand why people think it's dumb, but there was simply no other option in this battle besides just simply not having the battle at all. To me at least, I'm okay with the scene, but I do understand the criticism of it. Shiro then wakes up inside his house where Reen has been taking care of him. They soon decide to form an alliance as both Saber and Archer aren't at their best, but while at school they discover a spell that leads to the discovery of Shinji Mato, Shiro's friend. And yeah, let's put friend in air quotes. He is the master of the Servant Rider. But Shinji is a rather interesting character because due to Shinji's bloodline being rather weak, he is barely able to summon Rider. But Shinji does end up giving Shiro information about another servant who is in Ryudo Temple. Shinji is basically an asshole scumbag and a dick all in one word. And whatever word you want to use, he is the kind of guy who has a good family name and power but does whatever he can to undercut people and play unfairly. As well, Ryder is a powerful servant, and you wouldn't guess it going off what the series usually shows you about her. You only get to see her full potential briefly in Fate Route, but Heavensfield is where you see more of her. But Shiro does not want to fight this servant, and so Saber sneaks out at night to go and confront Sasaki Kojiro, assassin. Based on the real-life historical figure who lived in Edo period Japan and was a master at the sword, he used a long katana called a nodachi. He was also known for his technique, the turning swallow cut, which was fast and deadly. As Saber and Assassin fight, they start to both use their noble phantasms though, as they are stopped when Shiro arrives. But someone was watching them both and was scouting the two to see their noble phantasms. For Saber, this is detrimental as it would reveal her weaknesses and as well her true identity. But after the fight, Saber is carried back by Shiro and from there they agree that Shiro needs more training. I personally loved this whole scene because it showed an issue with Shiro and Saber and how they solved it. The issue is that Shiro and Saber are on different pages at this moment. Saber has a strong resolve and believes she can simply ignore Shiro's commands since he's weak, but it shows there is a distrust between them, that they don't trust each other's abilities. Shiro thinks Saber shouldn't fight because she's a delicate girl, and Saber has always done things her way and thinks she's strong enough to do things without Shiro. Afterwards, Saber then agrees to train Shiro due to Shiro's weaknesses and, of course, being a liability. During their training, Shiro and Tosaka figure out that the person behind the spell that was placed on the school is none other than Shinji Mato. So he battles against Shinji, whose spell has rendered the flesh of even some of these students melted. But when Shiro is kicked out of a window by Ryder, he uses a command spell to summon Saber to rescue him. Now both locked in battle, Shiro convinces Shinji to remove the spell on the school, and both Master and Servant escape. This is meant to parallel Saber and Assassin's fight and shows that Shiro as well can't fight alone without Saber. They both need each other in this war. In many ways, Shiro and Saber are together one brain, and apart, they're only halves. They complement each other so well, and they both realize they need each other in this war, and they can't simply do whatever they desire. Teamwork makes the dream work. And that's exactly what Shiro and Saber decided to pursue here. From this point onward, Saber, though reluctant, and Shiro are humbled, and from this point onward, they do not fight alone ever again. But Shinji is still out on the prowl for a new location to put up a bounded field. So Shiro and Saber head out to find their possible next location. And there, in the park at the site of what once was the Fuyuki Fires, Shiro and Saber rest on a bench, and we get a bunch of wholesome scenes to set up the romance between these two characters. But Saber ends up sensing the presence of Ryder at the top of a building, and after an attack on Shiro, Saber and Ryder race up a skyscraper, and there, Ryder uses Pegasus to attack Saber. Having no other choice, Saber must use her noble phantasm and thus defeat Ryder with a rather impressive 
massive use of Excalibur. This was an awesome fight and was the perfect time to reveal Saber's noble phantasm and her true identity. The fight itself was built up really well and it was full of great action and as well we get to see a full view of Saber's Excalibur which created a massive beam of energy that completely enveloped Ryder's Pegasus. Plus we had before this a great scene where Shiro reflects on the fires from 10 years ago and we get a wholesome scene between Saber and Shiro. It was overall just pretty cute for the two and once again shows the first glimpses of their relationship in this route. But immediately after the battle, Shinji runs away, but Shiro decides to tend to Saber instead, who has collapsed due to using an exponential amount of her magical energy. This leads to Shiro taking Saber back to his house, and during this, Berserker kills Shinji because fuck Shinji. He deserved it. But most importantly, we learn that Saber has used up too much magical energy with her use of Excalibur, and thus will disappear. Not being able to do anything, the days pass and Shiro starts to have dreams about Saber's past. Shiro sees that Saber is actually King Arthur. Artoria Pendragon, after being accepted by Excalibur and becoming King Arthur, devotes everything to her country and leads a life full of war and death to keep her people alive. Saber's backstory is quite sad. And almost tragic in a sense. She dedicates herself to her country and ends up becoming alienated from everyone and experiences crushing loneliness. But it also explains a lot about Saber's character and why she was so eager to get rid of Assassin by going alone. She's only conquered after all and thus thought she could, even in her state, be able to make quick work of Assassin. Saber became the hero of the people and the people got someone to believe in. But by becoming the hero, she became inhuman, and as well, the villain, to some. Shiro, as well, has a vision about being adopted by Kuritsugu after the fires. This strengthens Shiro's desire to become a hero and save people just like his father saved him. And in turn, he finds he relates to Saber more than he ever has before, as Saber is a hero, and he now understands her struggles. This then makes Shiro start to think about Saber and how he may lose her, now that he's grown to respect her much more. Plus, now that they have commonality between the two, he is sad that she may have to leave. I love how so far, Saber and Shiro have developed in tandem together. First we had them both fighting alone and getting put in danger, and then we had them finally get on the same page, and now we're seeing both of their ideals and how they both have so much in common between the two. I think this also strengthens the relationship romantically between the two once they do actually get to that part, because they actually go through all of this development not alone, but together. It's actually pretty cool once you realize how well Shiro and Saber work together. I guess you could say they're kind of an iconic duo. Shortly after this, Shiro runs into Ilya and she's not a psycho? In fact, she's actually rather innocent in this exchange, showing a glimpse of what Ilya may have been like before the Grail War changed her life. But sadly, that doesn't last, as Ilya kidnaps Shiro and takes him to her room and ties him to a chair in one of the most unsettling scenes in Fate Route. Ilya, straddling Shiro's lap, basically says she's going to never let him go and that Berserker is going to kill everyone and win the war. Heh, <sighs> kinda creepy. But unbeknownst to Ilya, Rin, Archer and Saber are on their way and break Shiro out of his captivity. As they're making their way out, Shiro notes how cold and lonely the castle is, suggesting Ilya, even in her state, didn't deserve such loneliness. But Berserker and Ilya confront the group as they're escaping. With them only having one option, Archer stays behind to fight Berserker, giving time for Shiro, Reen, and Saber to escape. This leads to Archer sacrificing himself for the greater good. This was a good scene. It shows just how twisted Elia has become. Isolated and alone in a huge castle with only her maids, she has simply gone insane from controlling Berserker and all of the awful things that she's had to go through. Also, we get a glimpse of what Ilya was like before, which I think is a nice touch. She obviously is insane on some fundamental level, but there is a bit of her true self that still shines through from time to time, and it turns out that this side is just an innocent little girl. And the castle in which she resides is simply massive, and in the middle of the woods, away from civilization. I love how Shiro describes the place as cold and lonely, and a place that no girl like Ilya should be. I think this shows us that Ilya, while doing some pretty horrible things, is still a person deserving of sympathy, as she's a character who's had her innocence corrupted. 
Now getting to the spicy stuff, Shiro, Reen, and Saber make their way to a rundown shack. Saber's magical energy at this point has bottomed out, and she will disappear if they don't get her magical energy soon. They have two options. They can sacrifice someone, which they obviously can't do, and I don't, I don't know who they'd sacrifice, or they do a magical transfer. What's a magical transfer? Well, they essentially have to have sex to do a magical transfer. So, um, all three of them j kinda just, you know, do that. And one of the cringiest and dumbest excuses for a sex scene I've kind of seen? In Real Tanua, however, they do a ritual to give Saber the magical energy she requires by giving Saber a part of Shiro's magical circuit. Either way, Shiro achieves an impressive magical transfer, and from there they run into Berserker and Elia again. Berserker was able to make quick work of Archer, and there he stands seemingly unscathed. Saber and Berserker then lock up in battle, though Saber is still not strong enough to take on Berserker at full strength. But Saber has a backup from Reen, as she is able to deal damage to Berserker by blowing his head clean off with some jewels. But as a result, Berserker uses his insanely overpowered noble phantasm, God Hand, which allows him to be revived a total of 12 times. This this serves as a little bit of an issue, and explains why Archer wasn't able to take on Berserker and survive. On top of pure raw power, he can be reckless with it, as death isn't as much of a problem for him, he can just revive. But something happens with Shiro, he is now able to replicate weapons of any kind, and because of this he replicates the ultimate weapon that would destroy Berserker, Caliburn. And together, Shiro and Saber use Excalibur to defeat Berserker once and for all. This then leads to Shiro always being able to use replication, which is something of a staple for his character. This also leads to Ilya falling out of the Holy Grail War, but Shiro is trying to be nice, and yeah, he, he lets Ilya stay at his house. The whole scene from Archer staying behind to Saber facing Berserker with the help of Reen, and then with Shiro who is able to start replicating was a lot of fun. And what a scene showcasing Shiro replicating Caliburn. Of course, to many this is an example of the shonen influence seeping into the fate route, and uh, I couldn't agree more with that. Though I'd argue this is one of the better instances of shonen seeping in because Saber and Shiro were able to pull off a sick father-son Kamehameha. Of course, Saber is Gohan and Shiro as Goku in this instance, and that is the weirdest thing I've said today. But still, this fight is one of the best things about Fate Route, and as well, if for some reason you're a sadistic bastard who likes to read the Fate sex scenes, then <laughs> go ahead. I wouldn't recommend it. As well, we have Elia dropping out of the war and living with Shiro. This is one of the more interesting decisions of the fate route. I would say the presence of Elia in this route afterwards is lessened, but her importance is not forgotten, maybe. But I do think there is something here that the fate route simply didn't do enough to develop, and that's Elia after Berserker is gone, because, uh, I mean, she went from psychopath to this sometimes kinda edgy character, but for the most part, she's just really just this wholesome little girl. It feels a little weird to simply just have her be this cutesy character out of nowhere, and it certainly is a bit of a weird transition. I would have also loved to see more of Shiro and Elia's dynamic just in general, as well, we know the backstory to poor Elias Veal von Einsburn. Imagine a scene between these two talking about Karitsugu. I mean, oh, come on, that would be amazing. Shiro, after the battle, has another dream about Seibasan. This time, it is about her wish that she made that brought her to this timeline. Essentially, Saber became a servant like all the others to retrieve the Holy Grail. But, Saber wishes to completely undo her rule as King Arthur, as she believes this would save her country from the destruction that was caused by her failures. So, she makes a deal with the force behind the Holy Grail War to get the Grail, become a servant, and then obtain the Grail to wish her rule away. And if she is successful, it would mean that her current self would cease to exist as she would be undoing her own history. But what makes this more complicated is that she made the contract at the time just before her death, so forever, Saber is being sent forwards in time as an incomplete servant. <sighs> 
It's not complicated enough. But the dream doesn't last. The final servant caster arrives to claim her victory. Very carefully, she has placed herself in the perfect position. With Assassin, now gone, likely due to the hands of Caster, she reveals her secret weapon, Rule Breaker, a dagger which can sever the contract between a servant and master, thus transferring the servant to the user of Rule Breaker. The dagger is extremely powerful and almost pierces Saber. Mashiro instead takes the hit, saving Saber in the process from becoming uh, casters. But the unthinkable happens when an eighth servant, but even more surprising, is this isn't just, you know, a random eighth servant. This servant is from the previous Holy Grail War. This eighth mysterious servant, only known as Archer, turns Caster into a pile of meat by rapid firing noble phantasms. After this, the eighth servant leaves but promises to return and take Saber as his own and win the Holy Grail War. The arrival of this eighth servant is none other than... Gilgamesh! And it was an awesome way to introduce Gilgamesh, I must say. Just have him come in, kill the seemingly strongest servant left in one fell swoop, which leads the way for Saber to explain who this guy is, and thus Shiro to learn more about his father and his role in the previous Grail War. I loved this so much, and this is another instance of a classic shonen style setup working for the story. This also sets up the end game for the fate route, and indeed, this is where the story picks up big time. Saber explains how the ending to the previous Grail War went. Kuritsugu ordered Saber to destroy the Holy Grail in the previous war to prevent another one from happening, but he failed. And instead, it just caused another war to happen much sooner, just 10 years later. This also leads to the revelation that Saber will disappear and be forced to relive her life over again. Not wanting her to do such a thing, Shiro goes to the church and asks Kirei Kodamine what he can do to stop Saber from having to repeat her past over again. Kirei informs him that if Saber simply drinks from the Holy Grail that she will be able to still exist as she does now for quite a while. This is due to the overwhelming amounts of magical energy that is in the Holy Grail which would give her enough mana to survive. But as well, her capture of the Holy Grail will mean that she will cease to exist in this timeline anyways. With much to mull over, Shiro then comes to realize he's fallen in love with a saber and wants to hold hands with her big time. So he tells himself he'll try and make her happy with the time that they have left as they don't know the outcome of this whole war. It's fascinating to think that Kirei was the cause of the Holy Grail War happening sooner than anticipated, even though he planned to stop it from happening altogether. It goes to show that Shiro and Kuritsugu both always try their hardest, but in some ways, they can't ever succeed completely. As well, the way Shiro realizes he loves Saber played out really good. It wasn't until he was met with the possibility of him not being able to save Saber that his true feelings for her started to make more sense. And while I think it's certainly cliche the way it was built up from the bath scene, the threesome with Rin and Saber, and even the scene had some pretty cliche moments with him falling in love with her from first sight and you know all that stuff. The overall story they're telling here though is pretty well done from a romance perspective of things. Shiro's love for Saber makes perfect sense to me because they're both ideal wise very similar people and in the beginning they didn't even like each other. Both of them just disagreed on a fundamental level. But as time went on and they fought together more, they learn to trust in one another in combat, work together, and as well share their memories with each other, which made them understand who they are on a more granular level, speeding up the whole process of dating. I guess you should say. <laughs> Anyways. In many ways, Shiro and Saber are two people who have the same kinds of goals and ideals, but they clash because of those similarities. They have different ways of going about it, and different expectations of themselves and other people. And because of that, it makes perfect sense that they both fall in love within the span of two weeks. To me at least, I think from that perspective, Shiro and Saber make more sense together than, say, Rin or Sakura. All of this leads to Shiro taking Saber out on a date, since she's only ever lived a crushingly lonely life as King Arthur. Shiro simply wants to give her a glimpse of a normal life, and they enjoy their time together. 
Shiro buys Saber a lion, and he has a glimpse of Saber's past life where she had a pet lion cub. And as their date winds down, Shiro asks Saber about her wish, and this causes an argument between the two. Shiro wants Saber to stay with him and not wish to relive her past and disappear. But Saber believes Shiro has no right to decide this for her, and thus, Saber tells Shiro she doesn't need him anymore, and this causes Shiro to give up on Saber and abandon her on the bridge. Shiro returns home angry from the argument and heartbroken at Saber's decision to not stay with him. But Shiro realizes he's kind of messed up, and he's returned later that night to the bridge to find Saber still there and heartbroken. The two then embrace each other. Once again, a fantastic scene because this shows that Shiro can't simply make Saber stay because they love each other. To tell Saber to not accomplish her one wish, the reason she made the contract in the first place just to stay with Shiro is kind of insulting to a person like her. And since both Shiro and Saber are very similar ideal-wise when the foot is on the other shoe, Saber has no right to stop Shiro from trying to fulfill his wish of being a hero of justice either. This scene to me shows every reason why I love fate when it comes to characters because it's about the clashing of ideals, especially those with similar ideals like Saber and Shiro. Both will not back down from their ideals and thus Saber and Shiro are always clashing on some level. They're stubborn. While their glorious rendezvous on the bridge was very nice, Gilgamesh arrives to put a stop to that and the three engage in battle. Shiro is the first to attack Gilgamesh, but Gilgamesh makes swift work of Shiro even after unlocking his full potential. Next up is Saber who uses Excalibur, but Gilgamesh's own weapon completely negates her attack and leaves Saber nearly dead and in a state of incapacitation. Shiro gets back up and replicates Caliburn, but Gilgamesh uses Merodach to defeat Shiro. As Shiro is down, he looks over at the state that Saber is in and reaffirms his own love for her, regenerates, and then replicates and projects a new weapon, Avalon, or in other words, the Scabbard of Excalibur, to fend off from Gilgamesh's attack and in turn deflect it back at him with the help of Saber. Gilgamesh then leaves them to retreat and Shiro passes out to then wake back up at his house being taken care of by Saber. This fight sets up how much of a bastard Gilgamesh is. We also see him use Ea, which is his signature weapon in every mainline fate, but this also sets up Gilgamesh's secondary goal, which is to claim Saber as his own. This, of course, is Shiro's waifu, which leads Shiro to use Avalon. Avalon is interesting in this version of Fate, as in all the previous versions, they're just scabbards, but in each one, they're used somewhat differently. As far as I'm aware at this time, though, it's only really used as a weapon in the Fate route. Now, at the time of this recording, I have not completed the Heavens Feel movies or visual novels, so <laughs> that may be a thing there, but as of right now, it does not seem to be so. After Shiro wakes up, he, he just basically can't help but keep telling Saber that he loves her, and so they get down for a second time in a row and mana transfer. Which is funny because in real Tanua, they literally just sleep together to make their bond stronger. And, and yeah, the sex scene... If you, you know, you have those on, it's as bad as you think it is. <laughs> After, though, sleeping the night away, or the rated R alternative if you prefer, Shiro goes to Kirei Kotomine and he needs advice for dealing with Gilgamesh. But as he walks in, he eventually makes his way to the church's basement, where he finds orphans from the fire that happened 10 years ago being used to fuel Gilgamesh's mana pool to keep him in this world. Shiro, realizing how fucked up the situation is, well, he goes to escape, but his servant, Lance, stops him, and it's revealed that Kotomine is the last master in the Holy Grail War, though originally, that was not so. Back at the house, Saber comes in to find Reen. Reen tells Saber that the original master for Lancer was likely stolen earlier on in the war, and Saber may have an idea of who it may be. But Saber then feels Shiro is in danger, and so she goes to the church. There, they both confront Kirei Kotomine, who now has Lancer as his servant. Kotomine, being sly as he is, tries to get both Shiro and Saber to turn on each other, but both refuse to do so. This leads Saber to accept her past, after Shiro rejects Kotomine's proposal to use the Grail to change his own past. Saber agrees with Shiro, and thus, Saber accepts her fate of eventual death. Kotomine then reveals the cause of the fire ten years ago was him, and that all he ever wanted was for the human race to suffer as it brings him joy. After Kirei leaves, he rejects his master's order and helps Saber and Shiro escape, but to do so, Lancer is killed at the hands of Gilgamesh. Now, out, Saber tells Shiro that she finally understands why she was originally ordered to destroy the Grail, and then agrees to destroy the Holy Grail. 
But while this is happening, Kirei kidnaps Eliasville, who turns out to be a vessel for the Holy Grail to be summoned. And while he's kidnapping her, he beats Reen with two within an inch of her life and leaves her in a bloody mess. Shiro is then given a dagger called Azoth by Rin, which was given to her by Kirei almost 10 years earlier after her father's death. Shiro then also gives Avalon back to Saber, now making her a complete servant, or at least as complete as she could be. This explains why Shiro has had the ability to regenerate as 10 years prior, Kuritsugu embedded Avalon inside of Shiro. But with Rin injured and Ilya taken, Shiro and Saber are forced to split up. Shiro will challenge Kirei, and Saber will challenge Gilgamesh. Saber and Shiro are completely overwhelmed with both of their abilities. Kotomine in particular rather creatively uses the mud of the Holy Grail as a way to defend himself from Shiro. Gilgamesh, the usual, his gates of Babylon and Ea combined simply overpower Saber. But together they use Avalon to get the upper hand, once again reinforcing that Shiro and Saber together are more powerful than they are apart. This gives Saber enough room to use Excalibur at full power to defeat Gilgamesh. While on the flip side, Shiro stabs Kiri through the heart with Ren's Azoth sword. This leads to Ilya being saved and Shiro ordering Saber to destroy the Holy Grail. I think there is quite a bit to like about this whole final battle and what it means. While not as grand as UBW or even Fate Zero's final battles, it continues to reinforce how good Shiro and Saber are together, that even apart, they still used Avalon together to defeat their respective enemies. And that's something that we haven't seen since the beginning of the series is them fighting apart. And as well, Saber and Gilgamesh had a pretty memorable moment where Gilgamesh holds Saber by one of her feet in the air. Also, Gilgamesh is such a dick in this route that you want to see Saber just kind of shut his stupid sexy face up. Damn it. It's just really easy to hate him. To the point where Gilgamesh treats Saber like a reward like all of the weapons he's collected. So seeing Saber basically take down this evil dick who has everything he's ever wanted and oh, I don't know, his existence in this world is also being fueled by a bunch of orphans from the fires as last master cause will think. Oh no, fuck him. Then you have as well one of the best things about Fate Route, and that's Shiro's battle against Kirei. This battle is satisfying after watching Fate Zero as well, because of Ren's Azoth sword, which was given to her by the man who would be killed by it. That's what we called poetic justice and Kirei deserved every single bit of it. He was an irredeemable villain, as he had gone past the point of no return by setting those fires, and then again, he went further when he used all of those orphans to fuel Gilgamesh's monopole. But as well, but, 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 as well, his desire to exterminate the human race and watch them suffer while it's happening, it just got a laughing off. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a dick. Kirei is a dark and twisted man, and he deserves the death he received. Plus, it was a pretty fascinating setting for a fight with the mud of the Grail being a major factor in Kirei's defense. While certainly not as big as any of the other Fate battles, Fate Route has a very humble but satisfying final battle that makes it memorable for its striking visuals in them with Gilgamesh holding Saber by her foot and Shiro piercing Kirei's chest with Azoth, while Ilya, his stepsister, remains suspended as the catalyst to the Holy Grail. And of course, all of the stuff I just explained before that, it's just, it's awesome. Now that the Holy Grail War is over and Shiro and Saber's goals are accomplished, Saber and Shiro have one last meeting, where they share their feelings with one another. Saber says she'll always love Shiro no matter what, and she disappears, returning back to her own time awaiting her eventual death. Now back at the Battle of Camlin, Bedivere brings Artoria to a tree where Artoria tells Bedivere to bring Excalibur back to the lake. And with that, Artoria is put to rest and dies peacefully, waiting in Avalon for the day when she can finally meet Shiro again. And at the very end, Shiro and the rest of the remaining characters decide to never forget Artoria and vow to keep her memory alive within them. Fate Route is in every way an introductory point to the story of Fate Stay Night as a whole. It's the start of a much larger story where you are rewarded based on what you've previously played, and Fate Route is the start of that foundation. This is why it's of the utmost importance to start with Fate Route for the VN, because there is important character development in this route that will help you in UBW and Heavensfield. Because in this route, we get to know Shiro and Saber so well, especially Saber, who doesn't receive nearly as much attention as she does in other anime as she does in the Fate Route. She is easily the highlight of this whole route because of how well she plays off Shiro and her dynamic with him. I mean, she was Kuritsugu's previous servant in the Holy Grail War, which 
to me, makes every single interaction with Shiro so important. Saber hated Kuritsugu and hated that he wanted her to destroy the Grail, but it wasn't until his son, Shiro, that Saber finally agreed with that decision. And not only that, Saber fell in love with his son. That's just kind of fascinating to me. Saber and Shiro initially don't like each other. They disagree with each other's actions and there is no trust between them. But throughout the 20 to 30 hours of playtime, they earn each other's trust and respect. And they learn to work as a team. Shiro trains to get stronger. Saber learns to put her trust into him and eventually that just blossoms into a compelling romance between the two. Saber's backstory as well was heartbreaking and showed exactly what she had to do to become King Arthur. She had to hide her true identity. She experienced total and utter loneliness. No person could touch King Arthur. And that goes for on the battlefield and as well on a more personal level. This explains Saber's initial discomfort working with Shiro and not trusting his abilities and as well overestimating her own. I do agree heavily that after how well Unlimited Blade Works and Heaven's Feel were covered, we do need some alterations to Fate Route to make more sense in modern terms and to just make it a story that should happen. For one, I do think the route needs to cut back on moments like the mana transfer sequence, Shiro's use of Avalon randomly, and especially Shiro's fight with Kirei at the end. For the mana transfer sequence in the woods, I think there is a better way to get Saber up to a normal level of mana. I think sex is just dumb. I don't think it ever works anyways in any of these VNs that have it. But I do like Real to Nua's idea of having Shiro and Saber share their magical circuit. But I'd have this one moment be the catalyst to Shiro unlocking his full potential. For starters, I'd have Archer awaken Shiro's magical circuit as soon as possible. Archer, of course, dies in this route near the middle, so my idea would be to simply have Archer get as much screen time with Shiro as possible. You just need Archer enough to help Shiro learn some basic things that Rin can teach him along the way. With Shiro's magical circuit a re Real option, Rin begins to teach Shiro how to use it and activate it when he needs it. This coupled with Shiro's nightly training and as well his training with Saber should better explain to the viewer why Shiro is able to hold his own against servants more easily. Shiro is a strong guy after all, and with King Arthur training him and as well an expert Magus training his magical circuit, he becomes, uh, I guess, more of the underdog of the underrated from underneath hero. This then leads to the battle at the mansion, which I would have gone the exact same way as before, except this time we see the battle between Archer and Berserker play out in full. I think this was a huge mistake in the original Fate Route visual novel and its subsequent adaptations. Let's see what Archer gave his life for, and as well with the mana transfer sequence now removed, we don't need to focus on just escaping here. After Archer dies, then we cut to Ren suggesting that the only way to keep Saber in this world is to transfer a part of their magical circuit. But I would have earlier in the story at least have Ren suggested as an off hand, last ditch effort kind of comment during Shiro's training, just so that it isn't as jarring and as well suggest that it's an extremely painful ritual and there may be some danger involved in doing it as they're kind of unprepared and not in the right place to do it properly. I just think those changes, especially for the latter half, would really, would really, really help. After this is complete, then we see the same fight as before, which has that awesome Saber Shiro Excalibur sequence, which I think should be milked for all it's worth, but this is where we build up the use of Avalon. You see, I think the way Shiro used it is fine, but I think it needs a build up and development that makes sense and just doesn't kind of come out of nowhere. So let's say in the dream sequences about Saber and Kuritsugu that Shiro has, Shiro starts to have these visions of an object and have him see visions of Kuritsugu implanting Avalon in him. But here's the cool part. Have Shiro talk to Rin about this and have her suggest ways to tap into this mysterious thing inside him. Rin should have an idea of what's going on here, as she is a magus, but she doesn't know the full story, so maybe she simply thinks this is just some mysterious jewel full of mana or something like that. This would make sense and not ruin the surprise of Avalon because Rin uses a lot of jewels and her offense and defense. From there, just keep building up to show learning what it is and then finally have that moment. Then after his confession to Saber on the bridge and the fight with Gilgamesh, have him realize what's inside of him and unlock it for use. And of course, just have it play out the same way since Shiro doesn't know how to use Avalon and it causes him to pass out at the end. I think that it should solve the issue of Shiro just using a love power up and overcoming Gilgamesh with the power of Waifu, even though Saber is a very compelling Waifu. I'm just saying.
But I do think that Shiro's fight with Kirei is one that simply hasn't aged as well in context with what we have now, and it's all because of Fate Zero. Kirei is a master at hand-to-hand -hand combat, and his fights against Kuritsugu in Fate Zero, <laughs> being legendary and awesome, also shows that Shiro shouldn't be any kind of match to Kirei. In UBW, they made Shiro defeating Gilgamesh make complete sense, as Gilgamesh was the younger, more cocky and less experienced person who was simply overwhelmed by Shiro's close range offense. Something Gilgamesh wasn't prepared for. That makes sense. But Kirei doesn't exactly have that excuse, does he? Shiro is simply not strong enough to defeat Kirei. But that's the key word, defeat. He's strong enough to hold his own, but he'll need some help with defeating Kirei. This is a more complicated issue. Since Saber is in her own fight, I would simply have Reen help out Shiro. Now, there is an easy way to do this. Simply have Reen not be incapacitated by Kirei. Now, with Reen able to fight, Shiro and Reen join forces as teacher and student and defeat Kirei. You can have Reen's history with Kirei play into it and still have Shiro defeat Kirei via Knife to the Heart. You could also have Reen. Either way, it's very satisfying. This also strengthens the concept of strength in numbers, which is what the route focuses on with Shiro and Saber always working together better than apart. You can also easily have Reen not you know, be anywhere near the kidnapping of Elia. Just have her off on assignment or literally anything but near Elia, which is also a small thing I would change. Make the connection between Elia and the gang much stronger and more prevalent because it feels more like an obligation for them to have Elia than it is something they actually want to do, you know? I think that the fate route has a lot more to work through, but I think those three main issues would easily solve a majority of the main complaints I and others have about the series. Fate route has a lot of potential, and with the existence of Fate Zero, I think Nasu should rethink his stance on not wanting that adaptation of the fate route. Fate Zero adds a lot of intrigue to fate route with the dynamic of Saber's master being father and son, even though Shiro is adopted. Plus, you have Tosaka's relationship with Kirei and her potential motive motivations to want him dead and out of the way after Kirei killed her father. There's so much potential in another Fate Route adaptation, and with Garden of Avalon being a thing, Fate Route would be a great way to close off the Fate series after Heaven's Feel. One of the main criticisms of Fate Route is Shiro not wanting Saber to fight. Nasu himself has said that he wishes he could go back and rewrite it as he believed himself to be more of a novice writer at the time. This pops up later again in this route, but it's the most prevalent in this route as there are too many interpretations left off to the viewer, and it's not good writing in general. As I mentioned earlier, I felt it's just, you know, it was a dumb reason all around on top of it being so open-ended. I think the Fate Route can be improved greatly by simply having interactions like these just reworked a little. This also would be a great way to make the relationship between Shiro and Saber just that much better. And, and if you can do it, go ahead and do it for me because I'm, a, I'm I, Saber's great and I like Shiro too. While they're really able to nail how well they work together, I do feel when it comes down to the heart-tugging romantic moments, it often feels like Shiro just wants Saber to not fight or do anything because she's a girl. It doesn't make sense, because it's proven Saber can do things just as well as any other person can. She's King Arthur for Christ's sake, Shiro. Just let the woman do her thing. And that's not to say I don't get what they were doing here. I think what was meant to be conveyed here is that Shiro's hero complex is physically incapable of letting anyone, ANYONE get hurt or injured. Obviously, since he fell in love with Saber at first sight, his hero complex has kicked into high gear when it comes to her. Essentially, Shiro almost can't accept the real threats of being in this Holy Grail war because he refuses to fully accept them as a problem in the first place. He's a hero of justice and doesn't grasp the reality of things as well as he should. Though this is actually fixed in UBW, with Shiro fully realizing that he's useless when he's watching Saber and Berserker fight like two ballerinas. Of course, there is still that layer of, I must protect delicate girl to it, but there is a key to all of this that I think is detrimental to the progression of the romance between those two, and that's Shiro's survivor's guilt. Shiro is riddled with survivor's guilt over the fires 10 years ago. Why was he the one to survive this horrid fire? He heard the screams of people in agony, dying, 
horrible, unimaginable pain as Shiro helplessly experienced all of it and he was the only one saved by the Kuritsugu. This along with his hero complex makes Shiro's headspace an unhealthy warped one. This is essentially why Shiro has to jump out in front of Saber or when he feels the need to save everyone no matter what. It's why Archer tells him his ideals are wrong and that they'll be the death of him because they will and if it wasn't for Avalon then it would have already happened. But this is also one of the main reasons Shiro falls for Saber. Saber chooses to fight, and that, to Shiro, is a beacon for him. Saber fights for her ideals and to protect them, and rejects those in her own way and fights no matter the outcome. Saber would die for Shiro just to win and get the Holy Grail, and Shiro admires that greatly. But I've got all the discussion I want for the visual novel out of the way. Now it's time to move on to the anime portion of the Fate Route and its much maligned 2006 adaptation by Studio Dean. So, why isn't there a new adaptation? A question that I have asked, and even on a couple occasions have been asked, why, why isn't there a new Fate Route? Well, a lot goes into this question and requires some discussion about Unlimited Blade Works. In interviews, Nasu, the creator of Fate, was asked such questions and the answers he gave were simply that the story would require heavy alterations and that UBW has all of Saber's story minus those flashbacks. He's also stated that the story is well known among fans of the Fate series and thus, without heavy altercations to the base story, the adaptation won't likely happen and won't mean anything. He also even suggests in one interview that the Studio Dean adaptation never even happened as he says the Fate route never got adapted before. Though those opinions can change, we've seen Nasu continue to make new stories for Fate like Grand Order Mobile Game and, and the anime, so I see no reason why Sony and Aniplex and other companies wouldn't want to see the Fate Route readapted with its most notable heroine and Saber being the main character and a focus for such an adaptation. As for my opinions on that, I think Nasu's thoughts are, are pretty fair coming from his perspective, but coming from a fan's perspective, I think that Fate Route can still be a worthy adaptation. The reason I believe this is because I just think there's a lot to offer with Saber's backstory, and can also serve as a perfect starting point for newer fans of Fate. Putting it into the perspective of the visual novel, players are meant to play the Fate Route first, then unlock Unlimited Blade Works, and then Heaven's Feel. So if they simply use the idea of the Fate Route being a tower that the viewer climbs to reach each route would be something I think would interest a lot of people. But the answer to a new adaptation may be in something most people have never heard of, and that's the Garden of Avalon. Though, that is a story for another day, so if you want to see a whole video dedicated to Garden of Avalon, leave a comment and a like on the video to let me know you want something like that. In 2006, Studio Dean was contracted to create a new Fate Route adaptation along with director Yuji Yamaguchi. Nasu even worked in an advisory role overseeing and recommending ways to fit the story of Fate Route into a 24 episode anime. Keep in mind, you can spend anywhere from 20 to even 30 hours like I did playing the Fate Route on my second channel, and that playthrough is still up, which I highly recommend you go watch. So to say the least, Studio Dean and Yamaguchi had a long road ahead to make this anime may work. So how did they do it? Well, to put frankly and without any bias whatsoever, the adaptation these days is regarded as one of the lower tier adaptations and series that has come out. To put this into perspective, Fate Khalid is usually more well received than Fate Stay Night by a certain sect of fans. So what went wrong with Studio Dean's adaptation and just what is so different about it that the Fate route could be so critically panned by critics and fans alike? Well, First, I think it's best we go over the changes from the visual novel to the Fate Route. Now keep in mind, I literally can't name every single change, as there are so many that this already long video would be even longer. I simply want to cover the most important changes that I think either disregard the original's vision, or is simply something carried over from Unlimited Blade Works or Heaven's Feel. And I will not be specific if it's from another route like UBW or Heaven's Feel. I will simply tell you it's from another route to try and keep spoilers at a minimum. To understand how Dean's Stay Night worked, it's actually quite complicated how they set it up, but it's an amalgamation of the Fate Route, Unlimited Blade Works, and Heaven's Feel. Fate Stay Night takes the basic plot and set up from the Fate Route, but somewhere near the middle section, and then starts to heavily take from UBW, and by the end, it takes as much as it could from Heaven's Feel and just kind of jams that in. In many ways, Fate Stay Night is one of the most ambitious undertakings, as it was trying to combine all three routes and 
into one. It's like if Nintendo, Xbox, and PlayStation did the fusion dance. Does it create the Nin play box? But just like taking a Switch and a PlayStation and jamming it into an Xbox, the outcome is not ideal, and because of that, Dean's adaptation fumbled as the execution, an idea from the very beginning was one that probably shouldn't have happened. To start off, the point of view. This is likely the most ignored change because people often don't realize it. But in the VN, the perspective of the character is from you, the player, or as we all know him, Shiro Emiya. Because of this, many people get a bad idea of Shiro in this anime as they think he's just stupid or some generic anime MC. In reality, you simply aren't experiencing a good portion of Shiro's story. You're only getting his decisions and only a very basic small level of explanation. This is most notable with Shiro's survival guilt and hero's complex. There is essentially no real development for these two key aspects about Shiro which are extremely detrimental to his character. The anime's version of Shiro Emiya is bland uninspired, and simply just not Shiro Emiya, if we're to be honest. He's a Shiro Emiya lookalike, with none of the charm or depth his character has. And they also sort of kind of fumble that a little bit in UBW as well. But that's a topic for another video. But moving on, and this is another element from one of the other routes, but Sakura's addition to this anime is... It, it's just not in the original. Her role in the visual novel is more similar to what we see in UBW, but in Fate Route, she shows up a little less from my memory. Since Fate Route is a romance story, well, there isn't just too much room for old thick purple, as what's the point of her being in the round to begin with? And on top of that, each second she's in the anime more than she has to be, it makes it illogical for the story to play out the way it does. If Sakura is going to be in Fate Route, then she should be the most powerful person in the anime. It's as simple as that. So when Caster kidnaps Sakura, I'm left wondering if Yamaguchi was even paying enough attention to his source material. Obviously, he was. He combined all these three routes in one go, which just leads me to think this was an illogical move and shouldn't have been a possibility to begin with. But it was. Also, what the hell? What did they do to my girl Sakura? Thick Purple is put in this hilarious looking latex suit that serves no purpose to her story or character. Actually, now that I think about it, Caster did dress Saber up just to defile her and other reasons I'm sure we'll get to if I make a video like this for Unlimited Blade Works. Comment below if you want like a, you know, a six hour video about UBW's visual novel. But even then, I can't not criticize this because it's, it, oh god, it's just so dumb to me. And and granted, this could be in Heaven's Field. So far, I've only seen the first two films, and Sakura in latex is something I can say hasn't happened in those films yet. Believe me. I'd know. I'd remember something like that. But I digress. Castro's whole story just seems to be taken from UBW as a whole. Everything involving her and Kuzuki is straight up from UBW, which really isn't ideal at all. Caster isn't a major player in Fate for a reason, and while I would love to see more from her in the Fate route, I don't want that to be more of just what we saw in UBW. It needs to be something more original. Another issue is that in the anime, the romance between Saber and Shiro feels like only the important, most notable beats to build a good romance, but with none of the subtlety and nuance that is demanded. Take for example, in the visual novel, there is hours and hours worth of dialogue just dedicated to developing and showing Saber and Shiro's relationship, their dynamic, and how they all work. We get to see these tender moments they share, the anger they express when they're fed up with one another, and the distrust and eventual trust they both develop. The visual novel isn't perfect, but the anime only ever focuses on certain parts of their relationship and only shows enough to make the viewer think the romance is happening simply because, well, goddamn pal, this is Saber's route. She's got to be kissing on Shiro and CGI dragons. It's sloppy. It's shallow. I was about to make an H scene joke here, but I decided to cut it out. Anyways, the anime still has awesome moments, and those moments are well done. We have the bridge scene. We have the final scene between the two. And we, for some reason, still have Shiro walking in on Saber naked. That's something we should keep if we do a remake. I just want to see it, because it's hilariously bad. And yeah... You know what, the whole thing is probably more due to age, and I doubt they put it into a new adaptation anyways. It's kind of cliche in 2020, but I want to see it. I mean, but that's the thing. We get those moments, but because there isn't hours and hours of build-up to these moments, it's, it's, it's just kind of shallow. And hey, listen, it's hard to focus on reading while Nick and Saber is just sitting there and... <sighs> anyways, 
And this is a massive issue with the anime in general, is simply that there isn't much depth to anything at all. They introduce it, and then they move on to the next thing. There is no real nuance or subtlety, and if there is, it's very hard to get anything meaningful out of it, because by the next episode or arc, they've moved on to, let's just say, the UBW portion. And here's the thing, this isn't a terrible idea for a series as much as you'd want to think it is. There is a way this kind of thing could have been done right. It would have required work and time, but for the Fate series, it almost goes against the whole meaning of Fate. Each route has a focus. The Fate route's main theme is oneself as an ideal, UBW's theme is struggling with oneself as an ideal, and then Heaven's Feels is the friction with the real and ideal. To take routes that are structured in such a way to be standalone experiences that focus on totally different themes is such a difficult task to do as one thing. It's bound to fail unless the person making it is a highly skilled writer. And don't get me wrong, I commend the effort from Yamaguchi and the staff from Studio Dean because there is a lot to love about Dean's version, especially if you experience it at the time. But this should have simply been a straight as can be adaptation of the Fate route. They sacrifice too much of a coherent plot to have all of these other routes just be shoehorned into it. Overall, I think the 2006 anime stands as one of the more confusing adaptations looking back on it. With UFO Table's involvement with Fate Zero, UBW, and Heaven's Feel, it makes Fate Route's adaptation look elementary and outdated in comparison. But from the perspective of a viewer in 2006, this probably was the best that many fans of Fate thought they would get. As well with anime production being different back then, and as well Fate simply not being the mega powerhouse it is today, I think for its time, Fate Stay Night 2006 was a good anime. Today though, the adaptation doesn't really have much meaning to watch outside of just general curiosity, or if you're a collector, I own two copies of this series. For reasons. Instead, I would recommend picking up the VN and reading through that alongside UBW and Heavensfield. Because even the UFO table adaptations of UBW and Heavensfield aren't 100% the same. They're their own shows with their own unique differences that make it more than just a straight adaptation of the originals. Now, forgive me in advance, I'm not able to show manga panels without heavy editing. So as a substitute, I will still be using visual novel art and anime art to express my points. Not many will realize, but the Fate franchise isn't new to manga adaptations of its stories. Fate Zero and the subject of this segment have received adaptations in the past, some of which have long gone out of print. This is one of those titles that have gone out of print, and of course, is a manga adaptation for the Fate Route based off the 2006 anime version. This manga released in 2005, and published until 2012 featuring art from Dato Nishikawa, a mangaka whose only real notable work is this release. With over 20 volumes and 82 chapters, let's dive into the manga and see just what this adaptation is all about. And... the manga is incomplete! at least for the official translations to English. As far as I'm aware, this manga goes to chapter 65 and it just kinda stops. There is no completion to it as that's because this was Tokyo Pop's last published manga. At the 11th volume, they just stopped publishing them and eventually Viz re-released the first 10 volumes after they bought them, but nothing anything more than that. So I actually can't bring you a full review of the manga because it's it's not finished. <laughs> like, it ain't done. At least the, the English version. You can, of course, buy this in Japan and be totally fine. My first expectation going into this is that it will follow the anime adaptation as it says on the cover. The hit anime, now is a manga. Which, as you'll now know, doesn't exactly put a lot of hope into this adaptation being anything other than above average, to at best, kinda good at times series. So, my hopes of this being a story which takes advantage of the format of manga and does a pretty good job at giving an adaptation of the visual novel story is just sorta kinda really just sorta dead. But either way, let's read it and dive into the manga. And really, it's just a bunch of annoyances. I really don't appreciate the manga's implementation of the anime's art in this. It happens every now and again, but it's 
really jarring and simply doesn't look good transitioned onto paper. As well, if we're talking about small things, the Tokyo Pop translation seems to call things different from what we all know and love. As an example, the command spells are called command mantras. Not the worst change, mind you, but it is jarring to hear mantra when you want to hear spell. Otherwise, not much different from the anime to manga here. I also think the art by Nishikawa is... It's not very good or fitting for the Fate series at all. While I initially liked some of the designs for Saber and Tosaka, it seemed the more it went on, the style changed, and his art just never really struck me as anything special because it was, one, never consistent, and two, it wasn't the best fit for Fate. One of the changes I do find interesting and like is the mana transfer scene, which is instead replaced with the VN version of Tosaka transferring a part of Shiro's magical circuit over to Saber. Though the terrible CGI dragon is still retained in this version for some reason, though for the manga you're going to be getting an incomplete story due to Tokyo Pop going under and no publisher really being interested in picking this back up for publication. But there are some interesting tidbits about the manga. This manga was largely created through computers, which at the time in 2006 was something extremely rare. The mangaka was actually just trying to be ecological with this, but he even had some trouble along the way and would sometimes have to redraw the art on paper. This is what I'll say about the manga though. It's a waste of time. Simply put... While the anime has some merits, the manga really doesn't since it's not finished and as well, it's just too similar to the Fate Route anime. If you have plans to read the manga for this, I'd just skip out and instead watch the anime over this. But even then, if you're in the reading mood, it's still overall better to just go out and seek the English translations for the Fate Route visual novel anyways. It's super easy to set up, there's no reason not to. As well, the art for this manga is mediocre, and it still retains all of the issues which have plagued the original anime adaptation. I would just avoid this unless your curiosity gets the better of you. Overall, Fate Route is a very interesting piece of media in and out of the Fate fandom these days. This is because it's largely just ignored by not only the fans, but even the creators and people behind the scenes. It's been largely untouched for over a decade now, with no signs of it ever coming back as UFO Table is dead focused on Heaven's Feel and Nasu seemingly having no interest to ever do it again. But there's always a truckload of cash from Anyplex and Sony to eventually get the ball rolling on that. And I personally would love to see a retouched and retooled Fate Route. It has the potential to be a fun series as romance isn't something we've seen Fate tackle much of, at least seriously. Of course, we have UBW and Heavensfield, but I would consider the romance in those routes to be a facet to an overall more massive story. We've never seen it be the main focus of a whole route before, and I think a new Fate Route adaptation could be unique solely for that. And while making this video all about the Fate Route, I've come to respect the story even more than I did before. Now, I see Fate Route as this flawed but entertaining story that is made even more interesting with Fate Zero. I think Fate Route and Zero are just two peas in a pod because of the ties they have and how well Fate Zero sets up the story to come. You can gain a lot by experiencing these two stories back to back. And with Fate Zero, it makes my mind race with theories about the potential of Jiro, Saber, Sakura, and Tosaka just sitting down and conversing about their past and what it all means for them. There is just something about Fate Route which gets me thinking about those small details more than any other route does. And that's why I think Fate Route could be amazing if it was rewritten. You have all of this potential for great interactions to be had. So yeah, I'll say it, I really like Fate Route and it's one of my favorites despite the route's flaws. Just for the romance alone, it makes the experience worth it, and it's really a great route as a whole. I 100% recommend experiencing the Fate Route VN, nor the manga and the anime for now, and pray Aniplex decide to readapt Fate Route with another anime in the future. So with that being said, thank you all for watching. But before you leave, please watch this part. With this video, I decided I would dedicate as much time as I possibly could to this video. I wanted to create a comprehensive deep dive into the Fate Route and talk about it because I felt it needed some attention here on YouTube and 
the internet. Nobody ever talks about it, you know? It's it's always Rin's thighs this, thick purple that, and, and never really any good discussion about a largely underrated story with Fate Route. I also originally dedicated this to reaching 5,000 subscribers, and since then, well, I'm pretty much at 7,000 subscribers, which I didn't think would have been possible for me at this time of the year. But we're here, and I'm more grateful than you can imagine, so let's shoot for 10,000 subs and beyond. That would be pretty insane since this is my 8th year doing YouTube, and to reach 8k during my 8th year? Hmm, that would be spectacular. Also. What kind of fate videos do you guys want me to do more of? I'm trying to release some more fate content beyond just me covering anime. Things that delve more into other topics like Lancer's Original Servant or talking about things like the Garden of Avalon. Anything you suggest I'll take a look at and make note of. And as well, at the pinned comment, the bottom of it, like just click read more, I'll put a list of all the ideas that I've had. And if you guys like those, you know, you can suggest those as well. So with that being said, thanks for watching the video. Thanks for subscribing and ringing the bell. Being a viewer, watching this whole thing, if you watched the whole thing, I hope you enjoyed it. I have a Patreon. I got a Teespring where I'm selling Mr. Kitty merch and as well a shirt for my King of Anime podcast. Buy those if you want to support me. If you don't, you don't have to. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later. Goodbye.